Hi, you guys. Welcome to Ask the Egg Whisperer. I should call it Ask Dr. Amy because honestly, that's really what we're doing here. This is just for educational informational purposes only, not to replace the advice of your personal physician. So please just always use this information to then be more informed and go back to your doctor, but listen to your doctor because your doctor totally knows your situation better than I do here. So thank you guys for joining me tonight. I love hearing from you. I'm making, I'm wearing my making miracles happen shirt. It's my Sunday shirt. It was a present from one of my best friends. So I love wearing it. So I'm going to get started. Okay, here we go. This is Sylvia's question from the UK. Hello, and thank you for taking this time to read my question. We've been trying for nearly two years with no luck. I've been diagnosed with adenomyosis and was wondering if this could be affecting my fertility as there doesn't seem to be much information out there. Most information is coupled with endometriosis, but I don't have that. I was just wondering if you have any insight on this. Thank you. So Sylvia, it seems like endometriosis is probably related to adenomyosis. So it's really common for people who have adenomyosis, if you were then to do a laparoscopy to also see endometriosis, it's not uncommon at all. However, 10% of the time people can have endometriosis, but not seen on laparoscopy. I know that sounds kind of confusing. Like you would think it's there, but it's not. It's called silent endometriosis for that reason. So whenever I have a patient with adenomyosis, I always talk about it as mild, moderate, or severe. I take the number of embryos that you have, and then we kind of talk about whether we should treat the adenomyosis, yes or no. And the treatment could be surgery, Depo-Lupron. There are other medications that can also shrink the uterus, like Orlissa, for example. Birth control pills is another example. But in cases where there's adenomyosis and you get pregnant, and then you want to plan for your next pregnancy, we often talk about doing things to prevent periods, to prevent the uterus from getting exposed to a lot of estrogen. And that means potentially using an IUD or taking birth control pills as some examples. So I think of adenomyosis as also a fertility threatening condition. It can decrease implantation rates, increase risk of miscarriage, increase risk of pregnancy complications. This is something that's well known in the OBGYN community and also well known for fertility doctors. So it's really important to get an accurate diagnosis and a treatment plan as soon as possible when you have this. So the next question comes from Saki in Los Angeles. Saki says, hi, Dr. Amy, thank you for answering my questions. I'm 31 years old and currently going through my first IVF cycle. I was diagnosed as unexplained infertility in May of 2019, but my new clinic told me last month that I had an endometrioma on my left ovary. They are two centimeter and 1.1 centimeters. And my doctor told me I don't need to remove them because they're small. What are your thoughts? How might it affect my implantation rate? I had my egg retrieval and four made it to a day five blastocyst. I had three grade A and one grade B. I had 12 follicles. They retrieved seven and told me five of them were empty. How does this happen? I did hysteroscopy in December and my doctor removed some scar tissue in my uterus. I had an egg retrieval in January and I've had a little lump on my crotch area since three weeks ago. Is it possible it's a groin hernia or it could be endometriosis? And if I need to have that removed and want to do my transfer in March, do you think another hysteroscopy might be necessary before my transfer? I have endometriosis and I'm worried if my uterus is going to stay clean until my transfer. Okay, so here's the thing. I can't tell how many embryos you have. Let's see here. You said you had four made it to day five blast, three were grade A, and one was a grade B. So my question is, how many kids you want, and does this embryo number help you reach your family size goals? So we know that there's endometriosis because of the endometriomas, and then the other thing is, I'm not sure if you might have what our previous questioner had, which is adenomyosis. That's a really important question to ask your doctor. I typically recommend doing implantation testing before transfer. And in a case like yours, one of the tests that I would consider doing is the Receptiva DX test that looks for silent endometriosis, but we already know you have endometriosis. So that score will kind of help me guide you. I would look at the fallopian tubes again, because we know endometriosis can get into the tubes. It can affect implantation and it can increase your risk of having a tubal issue and then possibly an implantation issue or an embryo getting stuck in the fallopian tube. So anytime I see a case like this, I always think, should we treat the endometriosis before we transfer? And the way to answer that question would be to do implantation testing. And then if let's say you don't have access to implantation testing, so then you can also just go ahead and treat it. One way of treating it would be to do a repeat laparos a hysteroscopy and do a laparoscopy at the same time. There's a supplement that you can also consider taking called N-acetylcysteine. And I do feel like based on what you have shared, scar tissue in your uterus, it might be a good idea to talk to your doctor about what are you going to do to make sure that my lining thickness is absolutely perfect before we transfer. And sometimes what we do is we 
start medications as if we're going to transfer, but we don't. If the lining isn't absolutely perfect, you can convert it into an implantation testing cycle and learn more about your uterus. The other thing that you could do is on the same day that you would do the biopsy for the ERA and Receptiva DX test, you can do a uh, hysteroscopy laparoscopy at the same time. Okay, so this next question comes from Anne in Arizona. Anne says, hi, Dr. Amy, thank you for being the best resource for me. I'm 42 and not going to talk much about my IVF not working, but I switched to a donor egg and I have a healthy child. I have a natural conception three years ago. Easy, everything, start to finish. First donor, six eggs, three normal embryos. Second donor, 11 eggs, five out of seven normal. My husband's sperm DNA fragmentation test was 25% normal. I have had a normal hysteroscopy, normal HSG, normal saline sonogram after a miscarriage. And then I had endometritis treated after a biopsy and verified gone with a receptiva DX test. Second biopsy, my BCL6 score was 1.5, barely positive, and my ERA came back receptive at 123 hours. My thyroid's normal. All my miscarriage panel came back normal with no issues. First embryo miscarriage, next two AA, five days, negative pregnancy test, fourth pregnancy chem biochemical, and I'm at a loss. As these were tested, good embryos, and I'm receptive. I've literally done all the tests. What gives. My linings were successful. They were 9.5 millimeters at check. I have four left. Help. Ah, this is so freaking hard. And these are the things that I've experienced with my patients as well. So in this type of situation, I would say, have you looked, and I know you said you did a hysteroscopy and you had a normal HSG, but I would say, make sure your doctor has actually seen the images from your HSG. I'm very suspicious when someone has had two biochemical pregnancies and it sounds like, no, you had one miscarriage and one biochemical. I'm not sure where the hysteroscopy was in the line, you know, in the order of things, but it may not be a bad idea to just do one more hysteroscopy before you do another transfer. It sounds like you also did all the autoimmune stuff that we usually talk about, like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome panel, lupus anticoagulant. One thing that your doctor might consider doing empirically. Empirically means with no evidence. There's no piece of paper that says you need this, and that's using something called Lovenox, which is a blood thinner. There are a lot of doctors that do this. I would say probably, you know, two to three out of five would agree that taking Lovenox could potentially be something to do in someone who has implantation issues like you. And I seriously think you've done everything right. Could it be the sperm DNA fragmentation causing issues? It's possible. I would say at 25%, probably less likely, but that is a possible scenario for why an embryo, despite being high quality and having normal embryos, uh, sorry, normal chromosomes might have a lower chance of implantation. So my gut is go back and look at the uterus one more time. Make sure your doctor has seen the images from your HS gene. If there's any question at all, that there might be a tube issue, take a look at that. Ask your doctor if there's any chance that you might have adenomyosis. The BCL6 test does not rule out adenomyosis. That receptiva DX test is only for silent endometriosis. If you have adenomyosis, it doesn't necessarily come back positive. So if your doctor is suspicious that you might have it, have them do something about it, like maybe one month of Depo-Lupron or something along those lines. Um, and, and I feel like potentially what you could also do. And I know that this is something that is a little bit more controversial, but when you've transferred three embryos and haven't had a single healthy pregnancy with this batch of embryos, it might not be a bad idea to consider transferring two embryos this next time. So I don't necessarily think that that would be a bad strategy to consider given the number of embryos you've transferred so far. And, um, and, and I'm sorry that you've obviously been through way too much. So this next question comes from Adrian in Canada. Adrian says, hi, Dr. Amy, I love your show and your infectious positive energy. I certainly do try, Adrian. Thanks for all you do. I just attempted a second round of IVF, which was canceled on day eight of stems due to only three mature follicles growing. I was on the antagonist protocol close to max doses of meds and sazin, and I was on the same protocol for my first IVF round minus the sazin and a different priming protocol. And that first time we got 10 eggs, three blastocysts, and all were normal. I'm sorry, no. All were genetically abnormal, my bad. The first IVF round I primed on estrace, testosterone, and Provera, and the second round I only primed on testosterone and Provera. I got my period unexpectedly in the middle of my priming but was told to continue priming through it, so it was on testosterone for over a month. Do you think our failed cycle had to do with the difference in priming or something else? I'm 38 and I was told I have an AMH level normal for my age, thanks in advance. Oh man, this is really tough. You know, at 38 years of age and you're trying and you know this is happening and it feels like maybe something is not quite timed right. And it doesn't mean that your doctors aren't doing anything 
wrong. It, they certainly are. There's, it sounds like they're trying their best, but I would say with the amount of medications that you've been primed on for the length of time, perhaps take a step back and say like, wait a minute, what are we doing? Let's just let the ovaries kind of relax and rest a little bit. And perhaps this next cycle, consider doing a more, um, like a gentler approach. Still try and get as many eggs as you can as safely as possible, but maybe not with full dose stem meds. Perhaps try something where you're doing a combination of, let's say, a fertility pill and injectables. If they feel comfortable with a medication like Femera, that's something that um, I feel very comfortable with. Another name for Femera is letrozole. It's like saying acetaminophen and Tylenol. Actually, Tylenol and acetaminophen, right? So Femera is the brand name. Letrozole is the generic name. So perhaps consider something like that. Um, the other thing to look at is your body size, your diet, um, activity level. You know, it's really wild. Sometimes I have patients, all of a sudden, they have a much higher egg count. I'm like, what did you do differently this cycle? And they're like, Amy, all I did was move more. I didn't necessarily exercise, but I just stood at my desk, I wasn't sedentary. I wasn't as sedentary, and I, I ate more. Uh, I followed more of an antioxidant or anti-inflammatory diet. So maybe making some of those changes could help you as well. And certainly, if you aren't taking CoQ10, for example, this might be a great time to start taking it. But I feel like your doctors are doing what they can. You know, getting three eggs or more would be ideal. However, since you had 10 eggs the first time, it would be great to be able to move forward with a cycle like that. So I think the failed cycle did have something to do with something being a little bit out of sync, maybe too much time on the testosterone if you were on it literally for that long. And then with your period starting, that might be a sign that maybe things weren't just as, as good as they could have been with the timing of everything. But I'm not necessarily worried. I still think that there's a chance that you could be successful at 38 with the number of follicles you got last time, even though all three were abnormal. And then one little bit of advice, when someone tells you your embryos are abnormal, it's really important for you to also do something, which is look at your official reports. Make sure they looked at something called mosaicism. And if your embryos were mosaic, you want to know about it and not discard your embryos because a mosaic embryo does have a chance of turning into a healthy baby. So if that's your only embryo available after you've gone through all your IVF, I do suggest patients do consider transferring a mosaic embryo if they agree. Okay, this next question comes from Diana in Oklahoma. And Diana says, hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 38 years old. I've gone through six retrievals. My first retrieval yielded one PGS normal embryo and the implantation didn't work. I had two subsequent egg retrievals resulting in one more PGS normal embryo. I had an ERA, was post-receptive. I transferred and had a successful implantation and then miscarried at seven weeks. Last December, I had my fifth retrieval and my doctor said I ovulated prior to retrieval. I just had my next retrieval today with six follicles, 18 millimeter plus. And my doctor told me I suffered from empty follicle syndrome. My protocol has not changed one bit from any of my retrievals. 150 gonal, 75 menopuriclomid, added in cetratide, trigger with Novarel and Lupron. I just want to know if you would do anything differently or if you'd recommend any further testing. My AMH is 0.7. So Diana, I would have you ask your doctor, why did you say that I ovulated the first time and the second time you don't think I ovulated, but all of the follicles were empty? That's really hard to understand. And it's not that it can't happen, but empty follicle syndrome is a very, very rare genetic disorder and doesn't necessarily happen in someone who has had eggs retrieved from follicles before. So it's still possible that maybe there was some sort of trigger shot failure that you weren't on enough of the trigger shot or the timing wasn't quite right between your trigger shot and your egg retrieval. So I would look at all of those things. Look at the cycle that you were, were able to get that one PGS normal embryo from and see exactly how you timed your trigger shot relative to the egg retrieval, exactly how many days of stim you were on, what your hormone levels were that day, and see if you can re reproduce that because it would be really great to be able to do that obviously, so that you could be successful. You know, one thing that you could do perhaps is use a higher dose of the Novarel rather than 2,500 units. Maybe your body needs a little bit more HCG to mature the eggs. Potentially try 10,000 units next time. You can still keep the Lupron. And if your doctor is worried that you're gonna ovulate again, do a cetratide on the night of the trigger shot. That's one thing that you can consider doing differently. Okay, this next question comes from Allie in Pennsylvania. According to the embryology lab, the inconclusive results are approximately 6%. Is this good or should I be looking at another embryology facility? I heard you say that 1% is good. So Ali, my um, answer is going to be as follows. Um, for those of you guys who don't know what an inconclusive result is referring to, let me tell you. So when you get your official report after you do PGTA, which means you get your embryos genetically tested, you'll get a report and you'll have an embryo number, you'll have a grade, and then you'll have 
what the abnormality was, and then the gender. Okay, the gender you can mask. You don't have to find out the gender. And then where it says, you know, the abnormality, sometimes it can say inconclusive or uninformative or, you know, there's nothing there. So basically, there could be either a DNA degradation issue. There could be something wrong with how the biopsy was done. There could be an issue with some sort of processing um, thing on the other side in the genetic testing lab. So all of these things are possibilities. So it's not common. It's not typical. And literally, it's about 1%. So if there's a situation where you are um, seeing uh, a lab that has 6%, I would talk to the genetic testing company that you're working with and see what they say as far as what their percentage of um, inconclusive results would be. And then maybe find out what, what they think the reasoning was behind the inconclusive results. Because 6% is a little bit high, I think, for most IVF labs. But I certainly don't think it means that it's a bad embryology facility. I don't. You know, I would say that it's really nice they're being transparent and upfront so you know what your expectations are, but I don't necessarily think that you need to switch labs, potentially talk to the genetic testing company, because for me, I work with about, with about three different genetic testing companies, and I don't necessarily think I've noticed a difference in their no-call rates, but potentially in your situation, there might be a situation where the no-call rate is associated with the genetic testing lab that was chosen in those particular cases. So that might be a good question to ask. This next question comes from Sarah in Massachusetts. Hi, Dr. A. I'm 32 with PCOS and no male factor. We've been trying for two years and had our first IUI around Thanksgiving, which ended in a biochemical pregnancy. I'm in my two-week wait for my second IUI now, but I'm worried it's over before it's even begun. My first IUI was easy. One follicle took the lead and was juicy by trigger time. This time I recruited too many eggs and we ended up triggering me with a 16.5 and 15 so I could do IUI before more follicles grew. My fertility doctor has a two follicle max for IUI. My lining was 12. Were those follicles too little to be successful? I'm starting to think IVF may be the way to go. So Sarah, if you're one of those people that just a whiff of fertility drugs makes your ovaries just blossom, it is very possible that IUI, I'm sorry, that IVF would be the best way to go because IVF is the only fertility treatment where you can truly control the number of pregnancies that are present inside a uterus, except for maybe one out of 400 cases. And what I mean by that is very, very rarely you transfer an embryo and that embryo splits, but for the most part, you put one embryo in, you get one pregnancy, obviously, if that embryo does decide to stick and grow, and hopefully, hopefully it will. So one thing to, to consider doing is maybe changing around your dose of medications. There's so many cool ways that you could be um, creative with your dose so that you don't ovulate more than two. Let me just kind of share with you what those creative ways are. So for example, I use a medication called Femera, also known as Letrozole, as you guys have heard me um, uh, refer to it as. And then the other couple things that I also do is for PCOS patients, make sure that your PCOS is healed, H-E-A-L-E-D. And I check your testosterone level and I put you on supplements like Ovacetol. So Ovacetol, you guys can get it from Theralogics.com and you can use the code, all caps, TUSHY, T-U-S-H-Y, and that's the PRC code for the lower price. So I like to give patients that. I like to see if you're a candidate for metformin. We talk about CoQ10 being on a good prenatal with vitamin D and fish oil. And you'll find that your ovaries are going to be a little bit more responsive. You'll maybe even need a lower dose of medications for patients who are resistant to these kinds of drugs. I also add in dexamethasone. That's a steroid first thing in the morning and another steroid called naltrexone. So all of these things together make up my PCOS special sauce for patients who have PCOS. And since there's no male factor, that's obviously a, a, a really good thing so that you can have the option of not doing IUI. So back to my suggestion of how to be extremely creative. Um, aside from the things that I just mentioned, the other things that you could do is rather than taking, let's say, you know, Femera, three tablets per night for five nights, you can perhaps do three tablets for one night and then two tablets for the next four nights. You see what I mean? The other thing that you could do is perhaps take two tablets for two nights and then for the other three nights, just drop it down to one tablet. So sometimes like those tiny little changes can make the difference between having two really gorgeous juicy eggs versus like five grow. And the goal would really be to get you to about 22 millimeters or so in size before we do the trigger shot so that we're not triggering immature eggs to ovulate. So you have the best chance for pregnancy. So I hope that really helps you. 
Okay, this next question comes from Nina. Nina from California. My mother's name is Nina. She's also from California, but I don't think this is my mom. You're a rock star and thanks for all you do. My husband and I are in our late 30s and froze three genetically tested embryos back in 2019. We originally planned to do our first transfer in spring of 2020, but put the brakes on due to the pandemic. Based on my job, I might be eligible to receive the vaccine in the next cohort in California. Do you have any thoughts on how to time the vaccine, ERA cycle, and eventual transfer? I'm wondering if you would see any problems with doing it in the following order. Pre-vaccine, ERA cycle, receive the vaccine, 30 days later, transfer must be 30 plus days after per my clinic. Could we rely on the ERA results from pre-vaccine for a post-vaccine transfer? Is there anything related to the vaccine that would cause the ERA results to be less accurate? There are work-related reasons to start maternity leave prior to May 2020 rather than after, which is why timing is really important to me. Okay, so to answer your question, Nina, you can get the ERA test anytime before you choose to transfer. It's not something that's time sensitive. And what I mean by that is if you get the ERA test done, those results should still be applicable to your situation even six months later. So I have patients just like you who we do the IVF cycle and do the ERA test, and then we're actually waiting for the vaccine as well. I want as many of my patients to be fully vaccinated before their transfer, or if they're pregnant already, I want them to get it as soon as possible. So fully vaccinated before pregnancy is my number one priority. However, if patients choose to transfer and get pregnant first, then I certainly advocate for them getting the vaccine in pregnancy. So I think your plan is perfect. Get that ERA test right now. I don't see any reason why the vaccine should interfere with your ER test results. And then you can transfer um, one to two months later or whenever your clinic will allow you to. So best of luck to you. And I'm so glad you were so proactive with your fertility and you did all the embryo banking before now so that you can now transfer and hopefully you'll be wildly successful with your first transfer. Okay, this next question comes from Kelly in New Jersey. I started listening to your podcast and I had a specific question for you. I'm 31 years old. My husband and I started trying in September. Found out we were pregnant in October. After several ultrasounds and blood work, I was told I had a partial molar pregnancy. After several ultrasounds and blood work, I was told, uh, I already mentioned that, my doctor told me that it was simply just really bad luck, but I was curious if you know anything more about that. I'm now waiting to get the okay to try again, so I really want to set myself up for success. I was taking a prenatal before and while we were trying, and now I'm making lifestyle changes. I recently consistently also worked uh, work out four to six times a week. It's very difficult experiencing a molar pregnancy because I don't know anyone else who's had one, nor did any of my family or friends ever hear about it. Is it likely for me to have another molar pregnancy or miscarriage? If you know anything about this, please let me know. So Kelly, I do, and I've had patients have this experience as well, and it is heartbreaking. I actually had a patient who had a molar pregnancy at the beginning of the pandemic, and I have to tell you, it resolved. She had her procedure to have everything removed. The HCG level became negative, and now... I don't remember if it was six months or a year later, she is now pregnant again with a healthy pregnancy. So anytime someone has a situation where a pregnancy is abnormal, no matter what the abnormality, I always say, hey, let's just get some testing done just for additional reassurance so we know we're not missing anything. And I think one of the most important tests to do would be ovarian reserve tests. Even though you're 31, you're young, you're healthy, you should have healthy eggs. I think it would still be helpful to do it. Day three, FSH, estradiol, and AMH. So that's what I would re recommend. So you feel like, okay, you're not wasting time waiting until the molar resolves. So in the patient that I just kind of brought up, the patient scenario with you guys, one of the things that I advocated for her to consider doing is embryo banking. So while you're waiting for the molar to resolve completely, you could potentially, um, depending on the timing and what your doctor recommends, freeze embryos until you're ready to get pregnant again so that once you're ready, you can use those embryos so you're less concerned. Obviously, IVF with genetic testing doesn't fix everything and doesn't 100% cure miscarriage, but is it can provide a potential option for you for the future when you're ready to try. So I'm hoping that my prediction is correct that you still continue to have a very good chance of a healthy pregnancy with a very low recurrence of having a partial molar pregnancy or molar. I have not had a patient have recurrent molar in the past. I know there are reports in the literature, but I have not had that experience myself, and I hope certainly that you don't have that experience either. This next question is from Inez from the UK. 
Inez says, hi, Dr. Ng, I love your show and feel quite starstruck thinking that you might answer my question. I'm nearly 39 and I have a gorgeous 20 month old son from an FET following ICSI. Now trying for baby number two. My AMH is very low. I think it's 0.2 to 0.3 in US units after a spectacular fail of a cycle. I think I'm gonna have to use that word spectacular now because that sounds pretty spectacular. I mean, not in a good way. Um, of a cycle in which three eggs were retrieved but zero fertilized, we're changing clinics to try again. I'm trying most of the usual egg quality supplements and I've been on them for some time. Despite this, my eggs were described as dark and grainy. Doesn't sound very flattering. There isn't as much focus on supplements in the UK for some reason. I only heard about NAD when listening to your show. Could you please tell me a little bit more about it, what it does, how long before a cycle I should take it, and what dose today? We can afford two more cycles, so I want to know I did all I could. Thanks so much. So Inez, NAD comes in different doses, so you can get it in 100 milligrams. You probably can get it in lower doses, 150 and 300 milligrams. I recommend to patients that you start at 150, and then if you can tolerate that dose, and I'll tell you what I mean by tolerate, then you can go up to 300. There is now a 500 milligram dose. Holy smokes. But I just know at 150, when I first started it, it took me a little bit of time to get used to it. And I'm not taking it for my egg quality. I'm taking it because I'm studying myself, right? I'm 44 years old, almost 45, and I'm looking at my FSH estradiol AMH levels over time. And I can tell you on the NAD for me, and of course it's not going to happen to everybody, I've noticed that my AMH levels have not dropped. And in fact, they're plateauing and starting to slowly go up. And my FSH estradiol levels have not risen the way I would normally expect as I'm getting older. So I've been taking NAD for a little bit over a year now, and I feel like maybe there's something genetically that makes my body respond to it, because I know that not everyone has this type of response, but I've seen this type of response in other patients as well. So the side effect is jitteriness, and I'm going like this on my heart because it makes your heart start beating, and you start feeling like you're having an anxiety attack. So that's why I don't recommend starting at 300 milligrams. I recommend starting at 150, and if you can't tolerate it, you can take it every other day, and if you can't tolerate go down to the 100 milligram dose. And I've had patients try and take it in a liquid form, and they have been able to tolerate the liquid form even better than the pill form. So I hope this helps. Next question is from Joanne in Wisconsin. Hi, Dr. Amy, I just had my IUD removed in October, and for the first time in my life, I'm trying to conceive. I had a consult with a fertility doctor, and it was the worst experience I've ever had with a doctor so far. Joanne, I'm apologizing right now. I'm sorry. I'm feeling pretty hopeless after the RE told me that I have a 0% chance without a donor egg. I'm newly 41 years young, FSH 28, AMH 0.01, estradiol level was normal, TSH, DHEA are normal, but vitamin D was low at 21. No follicle count has been performed yet, but a recent ultrasound showed complex cysts on my left ovary and several follicles on each. My OB thinks that I have PCOS and my fertility doctor wouldn't help me get my tushy checked, so I'm doing my best to advocate for myself. Am I really hopeless with my own eggs? I'm going for a second opinion in network, but I feel like there has to be something I can try. Any advice would be appreciated. Thanks, Joanne. So here's the thing, Joanne. You don't have PCOS. You have cysts on your ovaries and they've probably formed because your FSH level is a little high. All this stuff is super easy to explain. I would do another follow-up ultrasound in about six to eight weeks. And I would go to a doctor that you feel really comfortable with, someone who will give you the hope that you need. And other people out there are like, wait, a 41-year-old with an FSH of 28 and an AMH of 0.01, why would Dr. Amy say there's hope there? And there is hope. So no one died of hope. <laughs> no one dies of having hope. And hope stands for having only positive and practical expectations. The reality is anybody who's 41 years old, it is really hard to find a good egg no matter what your levels are. And your hormone levels suggest that your window of being able to find a good egg is closing. And 100% of us, 100%, there is no denying that this or that, we're all gonna run out of eggs, every single one of us. And just because we run out of eggs doesn't mean that all of a sudden our desire to have kids disappears. It just means we have to think about other options. So if you were a patient of mine, here would be my approach. I'd be like, look, Joanne, we know the reality of what's going to happen, right? But there's no harm in just trying. Let's just keep showing up, right? So take the supplements, you know, show up, see when the cysts are gone. There are lots of cool things that you can do. I mean, I'm not sure how cool they are, but 
there are things that we can do to manipulate your cycle. And what I mean by manipulate is potentially get the cyst to go away. Um, you can try a trigger shot. You can tie in an antagonist. And if your doctor sees follicles, you can even start stim meds to start growing them just to see what will happen to give you a chance for pregnancy with your own eggs. I find that it is really hard to go from, hi, I'm 41, ready to have a baby, to um, I'm now going to use a donor because someone just told me that in my first consult. The reality, the reality is that almost everybody still wants a chance with their own eggs, no matter how low the chances are. That's just being human. That's what most of us want, and there's nothing wrong with that. So I would say perhaps give it until June. Continue to track and trend your hormone levels and then do a regroup with your doctor and say, what do we learn? What are our chances now? And does it make sense for us to keep going in this way? Or should we consider other options, right? The other options, there's no emergency there. They're not, right. They're not going away at all. But I see so many patients just like you. I actually have had people that have gotten pregnant with FSH levels um, over 28 and undetectable AMH levels. And I, I can think of two people just at the top of my head where um, I was actually quite surprised. And, uh, and so, you know, I never give up on anybody. So if someone wants a chance and they have follicles in their ovaries and it totally makes sense for us to try, I will absolutely try. So if you want a chance to have one egg retrieved, there are doctors just like me out there who will do that for you. But at the same time, we have an agreement and we talk about what are our chances for treatment to work, and I have to make sure that my patients understand what those chances are before we start. Otherwise, I would never want to give someone false hope or make them think that there was any guarantee or make them think that I was some sort of deity or had superpowers, because I certainly don't. I mean, I'm wearing my shirt here that says, making, mir making magic happen. I mean, I feel like I, I, see, I see magic you know, happen every single day, and that's the impossible sometimes actually becomes possible. And that's really kind of what magic is. And I'm like, holy smokes, that was magic. I have no idea how that happened. It seemed to have been impossible to think that something like that could actually work. And, and sometimes it just does. Okay, this next question comes from Brooke. Brooke is in Colorado and she asks, Hi, Dr. Amy, my husband and I are 39 and 34 years old respectively and have significant DOR and quality issues in male factor infertility. We work with a great clinic and have the miracle of two PGT normal embryos on ice from our first cycle out of only three eggs that actually fertilized. We met with our doctor today expecting to receive next steps for a frozen embryo transfer but left the appointment having made the decision to do an ERA test and a round of hormone suppression for me to deal with suspected endometriosis. My doctor recommended the hormone suppression protocol based on my report of painful periods and heavy bleeding. But what if I don't actually have endometriosis? Would the hormone suppression have a negative effect? Would you make any other recommendations? We're already very attached to our two embryos and want to give them the best chance possible. Thank you for all you do. It really makes such a difference. Okay, Brooke, I'm actually going to throw in another wrench in this. I'm going to say, how about we try another IVF cycle? That's something that I would consider doing in a case like yours. It is so freaking amazing that out of three eggs at 39 years old, you've got two embryos that are PGT normal. I would say, let's do that again. Let's get more. Because if your doctor is suspecting endometriosis, then we know that the implantation rate per embryo could be a little bit lower. It doesn't mean it's going to be, but if there's endometriosis and possible suspected adenomyosis, it might not be a bad idea to make more embryos now. Because the amount of time that it would take to suppress your ovaries and get to a transfer after the ERA test, we're talking about like five to six months. So there's no better time than now to make more magic happen, making magic happen, and do another IVF cycle than now. This is, would be the time. So that's one thing that I would suggest that you do. The other thing is ask your doctor to also consider doing the Receptiva DX test at the same time as your ERA test. And if you haven't looked at your fallopian tubes, look at those because we know if there's endometriosis, endometriosis can also affect the tubes. And if you had a hydrocell things, that would really stink if you found out after you transferred your embryos. Believe me, it stinks like a whole lot, like, ugh. Completely annoying, completely annoying thing that could be preventable if you did your HSG, if you haven't done it yet. And then the other thing to consider doing, again, if your doctor is suspecting endometriosis, is a laparoscopy hysteroscopy and see what your doctor, doctor thinks. Because I think you shared that you have painful periods and heavy bleeding. So we wouldn't want to miss the opportunity to remove a polyp or remove adenomyosis. Sometimes polyps inside the uterus can come back as 
the diagnosis of adenomyosis. So that might be something helpful for you guys to also consider doing. Okay, so this next question comes from Grace in Ireland. Hi, Dr. Amy, thank you for answering my question. I'm 33 years old. I've been trying to conceive for one year now. My test results to date have shown a low AMH, around 1.2 in US units, FSH level 13, LH3, estradiol 1, TSH1. My day 21 progesterone was 50. I've had a pelvic ultrasound hysteroscopy, both normal. My follicle counts 14. My husband's 35, his sper sperm all came back normal. And we have a three-year-old who was conceived with no issues. Do we think we have a chance of working with my AMH and FSH levels? Is there anything you can recommend to decrease my levels? We'd ideally love to have two more children. So Grace, I'm actually pretty reassured by your levels. Having an AMH of 1.2 is very reassuring. Your FSH just tells me this is the perfect time for you to do IVF. I think sometimes people go online and they read FSH levels and they just totally freak themselves out. Like there's no way we could have healthy eggs. And your FSH level does, doesn't do that at all. It just tells me, okay, cool. But if you did AMA, if your follicle counts 14, you know, it might take growing 14 eggs to have one or two normal in the next batch. And then let's see how many you get. And then you can see how many more cycles you'll need to do. It might take more than one cycle to get enough healthy embryos for you to have two live births after, you know, after you do all of this, but talk to your doctor about the um, embryo diamond stuff that I'm always talking about after you go through your first cycle, right? So embryodiamonds.com, for those of you guys who don't know, the D stands for the day your embryos were frozen, implantation rate per embryo, which one's abnormal, which one's mosaic, which get all your official reports, which one's normal, Will these embryos help you reach your dreams and goals? And what was the sperm? I have to throw in a nest in there somewhere. The sperm on the day of the egg retrieval, because we know that sperm is really important too. Next question comes from Jess from London. Thank you, Dr. Amy, for all you do for us. I've done two regular cycles and two dual, duo stems. None have resulted in any embryos for us to freeze. In total, we've collected 13 eggs. My AMH is 0 0.2. I'm 38, no male factor. This last cycle, we only got four eggs and only one fertilized normally. We're hoping it'll get to day five. I take the supplements you've suggested, but I've heard you talk about HGH not allowed in the UK. Is there anything else we can try to help improve egg quality and get some embryos in the freezer? We want two kids and I want to keep positive, but it's so hard. Thank you again. So Jess, if you have not done a uh, chromosome analysis yet, I would definitely do it. I'd have both you and your husband do it. I'd also have you consider doing a sperm DNA fragmentation test. I think that would be, be really helpful as well. Um, I know that a lot of times when fertilization doesn't occur, eggs are blamed, but it could be a sperm issue as well. You know that saying you can't judge a book by its cover, but when it comes to sperm, you seriously cannot judge a book by its cover. Um, there was a really great study done by, um, by your, uh, I'll just go, go to the quote uh, that I'm trying to say here, <laughs> about 30 to 40% of guys with normal sperm analysis could also have abnormal sperm DNA fragmentation. So we don't rely just on the semen analysis, especially in a case like yours. And the study that I'm referring to is Blake Evans. He, he, I actually had him on the podcast talking about testicular sperms. So that means sperm aspirated or removed from the testicle. In cases just like yours, um, patients then went on to have a much higher blast formation rate. And I think, and I think he agrees too, that it has to do with potentially having lower sperm DNA fragmentation in, um, in, the, in, the, in the samples that were used to create embryos in those kinds of cases. So that's something to talk to your doctor about. And then certainly there are other things that your clinic might be able to use. So calcium activation is certainly one of them. So in a case where the fertilization rate is really low, that has been found to increase the rate of fertilization. And I'm sure it sounds like your doctor has done ICSI. Um, there are, are other tools that they could potentially use in the IVF lab to help select the best sperm quality, and that would be PIXI or Zymont. So Zymont is a special chip you run the sperm through to pick out the sperm that also look, look the best in the end, but the sperm that make it uh, through the chip also will have the lowest DNA uh, fragmentation rate. So that's something to consider as well. If you're not already taking CoQ10, consider taking that. Some people might say that in a case like yours, using DHEA could help, but I think for the most part, I wish I had some sort of genetic profile test that I could do for you. There was one available, it's not available anymore, but I think the best genetic test to consider doing would be the chromosome analysis for both of you, a fragile X screen for you if you haven't done it already, and I wish I had more to offer you as far as testing to give you an answer, but I do think that there would still be a chance for you to be successful with your own eggs and the, the, the IVF challenge here is really to get fertilization to obviously occur. And I'm hoping that you can get that to occur with some of the things that I've suggested. 
Okay, this next question is from Claire in Connecticut. I'm 38 and I have three euploid embryos. We're in the process of doing more freeze-all cycles as we want three kids. I'm already thinking about how to optimize my transfer. I've spoken with a few fertility docs who all think ERAs are not a great idea. The logic I've been given is that a woman's receptivity window fluctuates cycle to cycle, and that's more effective to use. Average receptive window timing is based on many thousands of patients, i.e. an ERA could be actually misleading and it's only useful as a tool to figure out what's going on if I fail multiple cycles. This makes me make sense, but still, like everyone, I want to optimize for a successful transfer. What are your thoughts on this logic? It seems studies on ERAs are not firmly conclusive. And I would say, Claire, I do think that studies on ERAs seem to be conclusive enough for me to offer it to my patients. And I've actually repeated it many times on a single patient for a lot of different reasons. And I do get the same results. So I haven't seen that it varies for the patient who wants to repeat it. So if you're suspicious, not that you're suspicious, but if you want to show that your window of receptivity doesn't change from cycle to cycle, I would do the ERA test. Most people, on average, of my patients, their ERA number of hours is receptive at around 130 hours. And, you know, sometimes I get a patient that's at 114 or 128 or 156. And I can tell you when a patient like that comes along, I'm like, holy smokes, I am so glad I did this test. Because had I not done the test, had I transferred and it didn't work, I would have no idea what to change. It would have been so hard to figure that out. So I do find the ERA test to be helpful. Um, I think it's so hard to transfer and then tell a patient, well, maybe next time we'll do this test. So I do understand that everyone has an experience with tests that they feel really confident about. And if with your doctor, they don't feel that the ERA has necessarily helped them and their patients. I'm not saying that that's not a thing. I'm just saying in my, in my case, I also take advantage of the ERA testing cycle to also see how my patients respond to the medications, change things around if they don't respond well, especially with progesterone. They might get some rashes, for example, to the progesterone oil. We need to switch things around. The other thing that it sometimes helps me with is I also do the receptiva DX test at the same time. I do another cavity evaluation if someone hasn't had one in the last six months. So there are other benefits to running you through a mock cycle than just getting the information for the ERA test. So you might want to just take advantage of that from take advantage of it from that perspective, not because the information is going to be helpful to your doctor, although it could be. This next question comes from Georgina, also in Connecticut. Use of growth hormones seems to be all over the place in the industry. Some doctors use it with every patient, and many doctors refuse to use it altogether. I don't understand why when it's shown to maybe help and also have no harm. Can you shed light on why there's so much resistance? Also, what dosage do you recommend and when to start in the cycle and why? My understanding is that eight IU starting at day eight of a cycle just a few days before retrieval is normal. The thought is that this is when the follicles will begin to have the receptors for HGH. Do you agree with this? Or is there an alternative logic to a different approach for HGH? So Georgina, I typically start it as soon as I meet a patient who wants to do IVF. So I start it sometimes two weeks before, sometimes six weeks before, sometimes they're on it even two months and they're on a very low dose twice a week until we start STEM. And depending on their situation, when we start STEM, we'll take it every other day or every day in a slightly higher dose than just eight international units. So I don't know why some patients respond to it a lot better than others and other patients have no change in their outcome, meaning they don't get an increase in the number of eggs, the increase in the number of embryos, better quality embryos or embryos that have normal chromosomes. So it's really tough. I wish there was some sort of test that I could do at the very beginning that says you would be a great candidate or you're going to be wasting your money on it. And I get it. If a doctor is not used to using it and doesn't have a lot of experience in seeing some wow type cycle outcomes, then it makes sense for them to not recommend it. So in their hands, they haven't noticed a difference for their patients. And I totally get that and I respect that. But I've certainly seen the patient who's had, for example, I don't know, I had a patient, let's say, you know, three or four IVF cycles with no blastocyst, and then I use HGH and now we have five. And you're like, the only difference was the HGH. So of course that's something that I'm gonna be like, oh, I feel like this could help you. And I've also had the patient who it doesn't help. Like that next cycle is actually the same as previous cycles that didn't work. So that's why it's a good idea to talk to your doctor, listen to them and see what they think could be beneficial with them being your doctor and then trust that. But if your gut is like, you know what, I just want to try this, then I think it's okay to potentially ask more questions and see if they'll still prescribe it to you, even though it's not something that they're used to doing. This next question comes from Melissa in North Carolina. Hi, Dr. Amy, my husband and I are both 29. 
We conceived her doctor in two months and she's now two. After she was born, my husband had emergency surgery for testicular torsion. He's now diagnosed with no sperm. We're planning on doing testing and IVF. Any suggestions on what we can do to have the best chance of success? So Melissa, I do. So I'm curious about what his testosterone levels are. I would have him follow a really healthy diet, avoid heat exposure, avoid hard alcohol, and anything that looks like a gummy bear that could be really fun to eat, like one that has THC in it and any other THC containing product. I would also have him look at his body size, making sure he's exercising most days per week and that he's in the best shape of his life before going through the procedure. In a case like yours, the other thing that I would do is talk about all the possible scenarios and how the best timing of sperm should be. One thing that you might want to consider doing is a fresh aspiration of the sperm with your egg retrieval. So you can have him, let's say, have his procedure on a Wednesday and your procedure on a Thursday. His sperm stays fresh and then they use his fresh sperm and inject it into your eggs. The reason is there's one big unknown. We just don't know what the quality of the sperm is going to be. And so you de definitely want to have all options available to you because if the sperm isn't going to be that good, it's going to be hard to put it through a, a freeze and then a thaw when your egg retrieval is time. So sometimes I like to do this. It takes a little bit more, um, what's the word planning, right? So you have to plan a little bit more in advance to coordinate everyone's schedules and everyone's timelines, the urologist, your, your ovulation, the egg, you know, the egg retrieval doctor, that would be me and the IVF lab. So everyone's available to take care of all the parts they need to take care of to make that happen to you. So that's one suggestion that I would have for you in a case like yours. Okay, this next question is from Becky in Santa Clara. Hi, Dr. Amy, I'm gearing up for my frozen embryo transfer. I'm wondering whether I should go with a medicated or a non-medicated transfer. I would like to avoid extra hormones if possible and lead towards a natural FET. I'm 39 years old, I have regular cycles, and my diagnosis was unexplained recurrent miscarriages. All pregnancies conceived naturally and all the fetuses were tested and came back euploid. So we did IVF to freeze embryos and considered a surrogate. We have four PGS tested embryos and I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, which may have been behind my recurrent loss. Anyway, back to the present. present. I'm not sure what to do about this embryo transfer. What should I consider? Okay, so Becky, I think what it sounds like is you're considering doing a natural cycle transfer despite being diagnosed with an autoimmune issue, and it sounds like you have several embryos to be working with. I would look at your embryo quality and then make sure you have enough high quality embryos to transfer. I think sometimes what we do is we use embryos at first that are high quality, and then if that transfer doesn't work, we're left with lower quality embryos that we might need to use in a surrogate. And so I feel like depending on the quality of your embryos, you might want to consider doing another cycle. That's pretty amazing and awesome that you got four PGS tested embryos that uh, were normal at the age of 39. I mean, that's like, those rates are really high. And I imagine your fertility doctor was like, so impressed with you. And I'm so impressed and happy that you have that, but I don't want to take that for granted. I would say it wouldn't be a bad idea to get another batch frozen just in case as backup. I'm just throwing that out there. And then as far as the approach to transfer, I think you could consider an unmedicated cycle. I imagine based on the fact that you had four PGS normal embryos that you also have regular menstrual cycles. So your doctor would very easily be able to find out when you're ovulating, trigger and time your transfer in that way to avoid extra hormones, but talk to your doctor about things that they would normally do in a case like yours to fully evaluate your uterus and the whole situation before you transfer because it would be awesome given everything you've been through for everything to work the first time. And obviously surrogacy is a great option for a lot of people, but it would be great to not have to use a surrogate, especially if they've diagnosed and treated this autoimmune condition that you're referring to. This next question comes from Kat in California. Hi, Dr. Amy. I'm 39. My AMH is 4.5, FSH 9.5. I had my HSG and my fallopian tubes are blocked. Prior to my HSG, my doctor mentioned starting with IUI. Do you recommend going straight to IVF? Is there something else that can be done to unblock the fallopian tubes? I don't have any other kids and I would like to have two. So Kat, here's my rule. Diagnosis before treatment, and it sounds like you know your diagnosis. The diagnosis is the tubes are blocked and it's almost impossible to unblock a tube. However, we want to find out why are your tubes blocked? Is it endometriosis? Should that be treated before you actually transfer? So in a case like yours, I would do this. Number one, embryo creation. Number two, make sure you have enough embryos for the family size that you want. And you can do that by 
doing genetic testing of the embryos to see if they have normal chromosomes first. And then number three, ask your doctor. And of course, you can ask your doctor along the way. You can ask your doctor, why do you think my tubes are blocked? And is there a chance that I could have a hydrosalping? So you want to know this before you transfer. And if you do, you want to actually, I know, I know this sounds wild and crazy. Remove your tubes before you transfer. Yep. Any inflammation in your tubes can decrease your chance of a healthy implantation. And you don't want to find that out after you've been diagnosed with an ectopic pregnancy. That would royally suck. Yep, I just said that, royally suck, and I don't want that to happen to anybody. So that's why I would suggest that you do your embryos now. You're 39 years old, take advantage of those healthy eggs that you have, given your FSH of 9.5 and AMH of 4.5. I imagine, I predict that you're gonna have at least one healthy embryo. And when I say healthy, I re refer to genetically normal. And when I say genetically normal, I mean normal chromosomes, because of course we can't test everything, but I don't think that you would regret doing the work to bank embryos for your future. Next question is from Jessica in New York. Jessica says, thank you for providing a safe space to search for answers. I have a three-year-old daughter and have miscarried twice since trying to have a second. Both losses happened in 2020. I never made it past the eight-week mark. My husband and I are 37. We did recurrent pregnancy loss panels and immunology workup. I was positive for MTHFR. My husband has low morphology at 1% normal and highest DNA fragmentation at 20%. We are a partial DQ alpha match and have other HLA partial matches too. If we conceive naturally again, should I push for an immune protocol such as prednisone or interlipids in addition to, um, in addition to Lovenox and prednisone? We weren't able to test the process of conception either time, but my fertility doctor still feels that the losses are due to chromosomal abnormalities because of our age. We did semaphore screening, karyotypes normal, AMH is three, all other testing is normal, no antiphospholipid syndrome, a antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Factor five is negative. We lead a healthy lifestyle in terms of food and exercise. Okay. So there's one thing I was looking for here. And I think what I'm looking for here is how many more kids do you want? So you have a three-year-old, you miscarried twice. And I would say, um, the, the way I would answer your question is, um, how would it feel to go through another miscarriage? I know that's a isn't that a stupid question? Because of course we feel horrible. But if you feel like you could possibly go through another one without doing IVF, it may not be a bad idea to have your doctor consider ovulation induction. So ovulation induction means helping you ovulate more than one egg. And this is a strategy that I use in cases like yours, where by doing that, there's a higher chance of a healthy egg being ovulated. And I'm using that word because it sounds like your doctor thinks that maybe these miscarriages were chromosomally abnormal. So that's one thing. If you're like, there's no way in heck, Amy, like, I don't want to do that. I want to minimize my chances as much as possible. And we know even with IVF, even when you transfer a high quality embryo that has normal chromosomes, there's still a chance it could turn into a negative pregnancy test or turn into a positive pregnancy test that later miscarries. So then you would consider doing embryo banking, genetic testing of your embryos, get your uterus ready and transfer it. And before you even did that, Let's see what we can do to get the sperm DNA fragmentation better and the morphology better. It sounds like you guys can fertilize an egg at home. Sometimes we think of morphology at 1% as a deal breaker, and you're just an example of it not being a deal breaker. You can still get pregnant naturally, even when your morphology is less than 6%. And in a case like yours, I would use tools in the lab like Zymot and Pixie or Pixie to potentially pick out the sperm and drive down the sperm DNA fragmentation before we put it into an egg for embryo creation. And this might help with embryo quality and it might increase the number of normal embryos that you have available. Okay, this next question comes from Ashley in Chicago. Hello, love your show and love your honesty. I had two questions for you. Number one, I had my second round of surgery to remove a septum. How much will this improve my chances of pregnancy? I'm 32, have PCOS, an ectopic pregnancy from an IUI, then moved on to IVF and four PGS tested embryos waiting one day for a transfer. We did IVF stem before surgeries. Number two, my functional medicine doctor did an autoimmune test and saw some levels that came back slightly elevated. It was my TPO antibody and collagen complex. I'm taking birth control and estrogen due to a recent surgery. Any advice around this? So let's start off with removing your septum. Number one, removing your septum is gonna hopefully be a huge help with implantation. However, removing a septum might require more than one surgery. And I think this is something that people don't realize. Your doctor removed the septum, but sometimes there can be a little remnant remaining. And sometimes removal can cause scar tissue formation. So I would suggest that you talk to your doctor about making sure they ruled out any remaining septum and any scar tissue before you transfer. So that's one. So I do think that you did the right thing for sure. 
and removing the septum was that. And then your next question about your TPO antibodies being positive. As long as your antibodies aren't going up and your TSLH level is less than 2.5, I think you can transfer without feeling any concern or worry. However, talk to your fertility doctor and see what they think. Maybe even talk to a thyroid doctor as well and have them run a complete thyroid panel before you transfer. I hope this really helped. Okay, guys, thank you for joining me on Ask the Egg Whisperer on Sunday night edition. I think you guys are all awesome for joining me tonight and hanging out with me for a little while as I answer your questions. My goal, I'm going to do Ask the Egg Whisperer, I think, almost every day next week. I want to catch up. I want to catch up with the questions you guys are asking because I feel so bad when people ask a question and then I answer like three weeks later. And so what I'm trying to do is get the number of questions down. So literally you ask a question and you can expect an answer that week. So that's my goal. Watch me reach that goal. I'm going to do it this week. So send in your questions to asktheegwhisperer.com. Paula will email you once it's your turn for me to answer your question. And if you guys miss me live, no big deal. You can join later. I'm not going to have time to live chat right now. Um, and answer your questions. I'll definitely have time for that next week. I love all of you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday and have a great night. Bye guys.